Haphazardly insulating an old home can lead to its rapid deterioration, as the drying potential of the building is reduced when we introduce insulation. Insulating comes at a thermodynamic cost, as the flow of heat through the assembly is slowed. While older homes were built with durable, moisture-resistant old-growth lumber, the lack of insulation and abundant air leakage allowed them to dry out if they ever got wet. Moisture from incidental leaks in the facade and punched openings wasn't a big deal because they could dry. However, insulating these old assemblies without addressing bulk water control and air leakage can result in rot. In this video, we're talking about insulation strategies for old wall assemblies. In this first wall condition, we have a wood-framed wall with a brick veneer, which was a very common wall assembly in the early and middle 1900s, and is still somewhat common today. The problem with insulating these types of wall assemblies is that they often have tar paper or no WRB at all, and sometimes the brick veneer was installed almost directly against the sheathing, so the sheathing and the framing were experiencing a lot of moisture flow inwards. The lack of insulation and the abundant amount of heat flow allowed the walls to dry out. However, when we insulate a wall like this, we're slowing the amount of heat passing through and the amount of drying that occurs to the interior. The framed walls stay wetter for longer, and the sheathing and framing can rot out relatively quickly. We also can't dry through these walls to the exterior very effectively, since there's a lack of a ventilated airspace to actually vent out the moisture. Presumably, we're not removing that brick veneer anytime soon, so what do we do in this scenario? To address this condition, the first thing that we're going to do is try to reduce the surface absorption of the brick veneer with a silane or siloxane penetrating sealer. What this does is it fills in the pores of the brick veneer and the mortar joints to form a hydrophobic surface, making it water repellent while still maintaining a high level of vapor permeability, meaning that the brick veneers can dry out as opposed to if we were to apply an epoxy sealer or something less permeable. So because we have less water being absorbed by the brick veneer, we have less moisture flowing into the wall assembly both in the liquid liquid and vapor form. Now, silane and siloxane sealers don't bridge over cracks and gaps, meaning that water can still get in here through small cracks in the mortar or actual cracks or voids in the brick. So we're still assuming some water is getting inside, but we're reducing the amount of water with this sealer. You could also paint the brick with a highly vapor permeable water repellent paint, such as a mineral silicate paint, a silicone emulsion, or a high quality acrylic latex paint that has a vapor transmission or vapor permeability over 12 perms. Higher is better in this case to avoid potential blistering. Now, we can't access the tar paper or the existing sheathing back here without removing the brick veneer to install a new airtight WRB, which means that we have to address air sealing and moisture control on the interior. So we're going to insulate the stud cavities with mineral wool bats. Mineral wool is very moisture resistant, it's highly vapor permeable and air permeable, and so it's going to allow for relatively unrestricted drying to the interior if water gets into this cavity, unlike closed cell spray foam which tends to trap water due to its cell structure and its characteristics as an air barrier combined with its high R value. But still, we are insulating and therefore we have to acknowledge that this alone reduces the drawing potential of the walls in either direction. Then we want to install a taped smart vapor retarder membrane right here. This is the secret to the wall assembly's success. The taped smart vapor retarder will allow moisture to dry out of the wall when relative humidity inside the stud cavity exceeds around 60%. So if there is a leak or if moisture enters through here, the walls can actually dry out to the interior. However, it prevents interior vapor from diffusing into the wall assembly and causing condensation to form on the back side of the sheathing and rotting it out over time. It also serves as an air barrier because we're taping it so we don't get any convective looping that could deposit moisture. We aren't as impacted by air leakage through cracks in the brick veneer or the sheathing, so this is serving multiple purposes. We have to make sure that we are taping all of the seams, joints, and penetrations in this membrane to ensure that it's functioning as an air barrier. Then we want to install 2x3 horizontal strapping or furring strips, which provide an airtight service cavity for electrical conduit and other services, and also as the fastening base for the drywall right here. We want to make sure that we're using a fiberglass matte face gypsum board like dense glass or USG's equivalent. Fiberglass matte face gypsum does not have a paper facer like standard drywall, and therefore it's not going to be a potential food source for mold. We're calling this out because we're expecting some moisture to be flowing through this assembly, and we don't want to take any chances with mold here. So if we have a reservoir cladding like a brick veneer in a wall condition like this, it's a good idea to install something that's moisture resistant if water leaks through or if we get a lot of vapor passing through. Is it absolutely necessary? Uh, the short answer is no, but it decreases your risk of a failure or a callback. So that's how to address an old framed wall with a brick masonry veneer. If you're wondering how to insulate an old mass masonry wall, I have a whole video dedicated to that which you can watch right here. A link will also be in the description.
Sometimes really old walls didn't have sheathing, where the wood siding was fastened directly to the studs and occasionally separated by a layer of tar paper if you're lucky. These types of walls can be very tricky to insulate, especially if you can't remove the siding for historical purposes, as there tends to be an enormous amount of water and air leakage in these types of walls. Remember, we don't want to insulate until we've controlled water and controlled air leakage, since insulating reduces the drying potential of the walls, meaning that they stay wetter for longer. So if we can't remove the siding, one option that we have is to provide a drainage plane and an air gap on the interior side behind the siding. Now, I'll say up front that this strategy is labor intensive and requires a great amount of workmanship and attention to detail. If this can't be guaranteed, don't bother insulating. So behind the existing siding or tar paper, we're installing a dimple mat. This dimple mat serves a few purposes. It serves as a drainage plane, a waterproofing layer, and an air gap behind the existing siding as basically functioning as a rain screen for the existing siding. So any water that gets behind here will just drip down the dimple mat instead of ending up in the wall cavity and rotting it out if we insulate it. And then over the dimple mat we want to install an air barrier membrane. In this horizontal wall detail, you can see that we have our air barrier here that's stapled to the studs and air sealed with a high quality air sealing tape like that. And that will prevent air leakage from the exterior getting into the stud cavities and potentially condensing on the back side of the drywall if we're in a more humid climate. So after each stud bay has been air sealed with that air barrier membrane, then we want to insulate it with mineral wool. This mineral wool allows moisture to dry out of the wall cavity if it ends up there. It's vapor permeable, it's moisture resistant, and it's not going to impact the moisture dynamics of the building as much as something like spray foam, as we're not encapsulating the studs in foam that could impact the wall's ability to dry out. Again, this is a very very high risk wall condition and we need to make sure that we are providing an opportunity for water to dry out. Then we have a taped smart vapor retarder membrane here. The smart vapor retarder is serving as our interior air barrier and our vapor control layer as we still need to prevent interior vapor from diffusing into the wall cavity and potentially condensing on the back side of the dimple mat in colder climates as then we'll have liquid water inside the walls. And then we have 2x3 strapping which is installed to provide an airtight surface cavity for the smart vapor retarder and then we have fiberglass mat face gypsum with latex paint. You could opt for a typical paper face gypsum product, but this fiberglass matte face gypsum will provide more resistance to moisture and mold growth in these high risk walls. Now, we also need to protect the sill plates in this wall assembly from getting wet, since water that trickles down the dimple mat needs a path to drain out. It can't just sit on the sill plates. So in this assembly, you see that we actually need to remove the bottom course of siding to access the sill plate on the exterior. And that should be okay in most cases with historic buildings if you address it as a siding repair and if it matches the existing conditions. We terminate the dimple mat on top of a new stainless Z flashing with end dams and with a flashing membrane underneath. So if we zoom in right here, we have our Z flashing and then we have a new flashing membrane underneath which extends down and past the floor assembly down to the foundation and right over a new base flashing with a drip edge. So any water that drains down the dimple mat will hit that Z flashing and drain away from the walls. And then we have an eighth of an inch or quarter inch entangled mesh right here and that provides a thin low profile drainage gap behind the siding so any water that gets behind the siding can actually drain out and dry and not be held in tension. We don't need a big drainage space but we need a little bit of a gap to provide that drainage. You could also use strips of a drainable self-adhered WRB like Hydrogap SA or Typar drainable peel and stick. Then if we zoom in here, you can see how the smart vapor retarder is air sealed and integrated into the new floor sheathing and taped and sealed at the bottom. And then our siding gets reinstalled over that. So to summarize, the dimple mat provides our drainage plane and water control layer. Water drains down and hits the flashing and drains down and out through the entangled mesh without compromising the framing. And then we're air sealing with the air barrier membrane and the smart vapor retarder. You can find more details about the solution in my most recent book, A Guide to Moisture Management for Residential Remodels, where we discuss a wide range of solutions that work for a lot of different building conditions, including old walls like this, mass masonry, old basements, crawl spaces and slabs, roofs, windows, and much more. Links to the ebook will be in the description below. Now, if we can alter the exterior, but we can't touch the interior, whether we have some historical finish work or existing lath and plaster that we can't remove for whatever reason, but we can at least access the exterior sheathing and stud cavities, we can address water control, air sealing, and insulating from the exterior. So we can remove 
remove the existing sheathing and install new unfaced bats or blown in insulation of your choosing. This could be mineral wool, this could be wood fiber insulation, fiberglass, but we probably want to specify something like mineral wool or a borate treated cellulose. We also want this cavity insulation to be vapor permeable so that the walls can dry out, which is why we want something like mineral wool, fiberglass, or cellulose. Then we have some new plywood sheathing. We like plywood because it's moisture resistant, it has a higher hydric buffer capacity, so if it does get wet, it will be less impacted by moisture, and it's more vapor open than OSB. So we're resheathing the walls with plywood to provide a stable uniform substrate for the new weather resistant barrier. Now, could you use OSB? The answer is yes, but plywood is preferred here. If you need a better fire rating, you could swap out the wood sheathing for Dens Glass Gold, which is a gypsum sheathing. And then over that, we want to install a new self-adhered or fluid applied weather resistant barrier. And this is going to serve primarily as our water control layer, but also as our air barrier, since we don't want any water or air leakage finding a path into the wall cavity. We want to make sure that we're keeping everything dry for a long time, so specifying a self-adhered or fluid applied weather barrier system will ensure that we have a very robust airtight waterproofing system since it's essentially bonded to the sheathing, preventing air and water from traveling between the sheathing and the WRV. And then installed over the weather barrier, we have a couple layers of exterior rigid insulation with staggered and offset joints in the form of rigid mineral wool. Here we're using Comfort Board, which is a rock wool product. The rigid insulation warms the condensing surface of the sheathing back here, so any moisture that diffuses through the assembly won't actually condense on the plywood sheathing if we're using the right ratios, and it will allow vapor to freely pass through. Additionally, it prevents thermal bridging through the studs, so we get a very high effective R value on the exterior. If you want to, you could swap out the rock wool for rigid foam insulation. You could use rigid wood fiber, so there's a lot of options here. But rigid mineral wool is my preferred option here, since it's resistant to insects and they can't burrow very easily into that rigid insulation, unlike foam products. We want to make sure that the insulation that we choose remains durable. Additionally, rigid rock wool provides some good fire resistance to the wall assembly since it's non-combustible, unlike foam which burns and melts. So this is a really great option if you're building in a region prone to wildfires. And then installed over the rigid insulation, we have vertical furring strips that are fastened with epoxy coated steel screws into the existing studs every 12 to 16 inches on center. For the furring strips, we want to use 1x4s or metal hat channels. And finally, we have a new beveled lap siding to match existing conditions, or we can install something completely new and different. So that's our option if we're dealing with an existing frame wall with lath and plaster or other interior finishes that we can't disturb, but we have access to that wall from the exterior. For more information on insulating and dressing moisture in old buildings, head over to my website at asiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that range from how to insulate a wide range of old structures and old building conditions, to waterproofing leaky basements, to flat roof design. Also, don't forget to pick up my guide to moisture management for residential remodels. This is really important stuff that you need to know before remodeling or renovating. Links to those will be in the description below. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.